Welcome to Huntington Beach State Park. I'm Ranger Mike and I'm going to be your guide this morning as we explore the secrets of a salt marsh. Using the boardwalk located right next to our new nature center, we're going to be exploring a salt marsh ecosystem. We're going to be learning what biotic and abiotic factors are, what limiting factors are, and what you can do to help protect the salt marsh for future generations. Ready to get wet? Follow me. Today at the Salt Marsh, we're going to be learning about the biotic and abiotic factors of an ecosystem. Does anyone know what a biotic factor is? That's right. The biotic factors are the living components of an ecosystem. What do you think might be the biotic factors here in the Salt Marsh? They would include things like the Spartina grass, which you see growing in great abundance right behind me. Uh, it would also include things like the periwinkle snails, uh, mama chog fish, uh, fiddler crabs, uh, oysters, uh, just to name a few. Now, biotic factors also extends beyond just a simple list of the plants and animals that live in an ecosystem. It also includes things like predation, uh, how different animals in the salt marsh avoid predators, how they find mates and reproduce their species, uh, migration. All of these are examples of biotic factors. Now let's discuss the abiotic factors. Abiotic means non-living. And here in the salt marsh, what do you think would be the main abiotic factors? Well, being a marsh, being a type of wetland, the main abiotic factors here are going to involve the water. And what kind of water do we find in the salt marsh? That's right, this water is very salty. It's a seawater coming to us from the ocean via the tides. Now, tides can vary a lot depending on where in the world you are, but here along the coast of South Carolina, we have two tidal cycles every 24 hours. So it takes about six hours for the tide to come in and flood the salt marsh, and then about six hours for it to drain back into the ocean. Now, that water level that, that is constantly changing because of the tides is a very big abiotic factor that the plants and animals that call the salt marsh home have to deal with. But there's also something special about this water. Uh, as you probably have guessed from this being a salt marsh, this is full strength seawaters. And that's where this salt marsh here at Huntington Beach State Park is a little bit different from some of the others you might find along the South Carolina coast. That's because most salt marshes occur where you have a freshwater river meeting the ocean. So most salt marshes are a blend of seawater and freshwater called brackish. But here at Huntington Beach State Park, we do not have any freshwater rivers, meaning the ocean. All of this water is coming in from the Atlantic Ocean. So we have a very salty salt marsh. The salinity, or the amount of salt dissolved in the water, is the same as you would find in the open ocean out off our coast. Now, what do you think might be some of the other abiotic, non-living factors of the salt marsh? the pluff mud, uh, which is where many of the animals like fiddler crabs live, uh, would definitely be one. Uh, the temperature of the water or the temperature of the air could be others. The salt marsh can get very hot on a summer day and also can get very cool on a winter day. Um, the pH of the water uh, could be another factor. So these are just some examples of the various abiotic non-living factors found here in the salt marsh. So right at the up upper edges of the salt marsh, uh, in the areas that the tides only very rarely reach, uh, we have the maritime forest. Now, while the tides only rarely get up here, uh, and the only tides that ever would get up here would be the spring tides. Those are the highest high tides. You get around a full moon and a new moon. Uh, those are extra extreme high tides because during those times of the month, you've got the gravitational pull of the moon and the gravitational pull of the sun kind of pulling in the same direction. So you wind up with those highest of the high tides, the spring tides, called because that's the time of the month when the ocean springs beyond its normal boundary. But there is another abiotic factor that comes into play here, 
hurricanes. And right here, we can see some red cedar trees that have definitely been impacted by the hurricanes. Notice that their roots are now up in the air. Underneath of it here, you can actually get a look at what the soil would be in the maritime forest, right along the edge of the salt marsh. And as you can see, it's pretty sandy. And that's because most of the maritime forest here, in fact, much of the park, is actually made up of the remnants of ancient sand dunes. So as we move back from that, you can notice uh, the brack that we see here at our feet, W-R-A-C-K. Rack uh, is the dead portion of the Spartina grass we've already talked about. That Spartina grass undergoes a big seasonal change, dies back every fall of the year. And once it does, it forms this rack. Now, because the rack is hollow, it floats really well. This also helps the Spartina grass deal with an abiotic factor when it's alive. The Spartina grass can use the hollow insides of its stem as a snorkel to help it exchange gases when the tides are high. But because it's hollow, it also floats really well. So you can see the rack piled up here very thickly along the edge of the salt marsh. Uh, that is done by the forces of the spring tides and from the hurricanes. Uh, also, a lot of this rack will float out of the salt marsh on an outgoing tide. It'll wind up getting pushed up on the beach by a spring high tide, and that is what will start the formation of sand dunes. So next time you go to the beach, if you had x-ray vision, if you could look into the heart of those sand dunes, this rack is what would be at the core of it. It's what gives the sand on the beach some structure, something, uh, a framework almost to build around to start forming those very important sand dunes. Now, we're going to walk a little bit further out into the salt marsh. So as we get a little bit out, you notice the plant life definitely starts to change. Uh, in fact, the plant life starts uh, to disappear. Uh, right up here in the upper edges, uh, we just have a couple of species that can survive up here. We're starting to see a few of the Spartina grass plants growing. Uh, there's also some sea oxide daisy. Uh, uh, black needle rush a, fur, a little bit further down, uh, but the diversity of plant life is starting to diminish greatly. And why is that? Because it's very difficult to deal with some of these abiotic factors out here, especially that constant flooding from those twice a day high tides and because of that flooding with seawater. And then as we walk a little further out, we kind of have a no man's land uh, where there are no grasses growing. And then we start to get into the Spartina grass. Now, as we walk out here, uh, we're going to notice that the, competition, the, the, uh, the composition of the substrate is going to change. So right at the edge of the maritime forest, coming into the very upper reaches of the salt marsh, it's very sandy. Um, but as we go out here, it becomes a lot siltier and muddier. And you can see there's a lot of raccoon tracks out here. And if you watch my feet, the further out here I walk, I am starting to sink down into the mud. So right now we're getting into the plus mud. Now, pluff mud um, is what we call this, uh, the mud that you find here in the salt marsh. Uh, it's full, uh, it's very silty, uh, it's full of organic matter. It is also very anaerobic. And what does that mean? That anaerobic means without oxygen. So as you walk through the pluff mud, you're going to be releasing uh, a gas known as hydrogen sulfide. And it is a bit stinky if you're not familiar with it. I grew up on the salt marsh, so it smells like home to me. Uh, but to most other people, it kind of smells like rotten eggs. Uh, but that is the actual na natural odor of the salt marsh. And it's just because there's no oxygen down there in the mud. Um, and then as we get myself unstuck here, now we're finally getting into the actual Spartina grass, which is changing color. This is all a beautiful green color uh, in, the, in the summer. But as we get into the fall, then the winter, the outer uh, stalks and leaves start to turn a nice golden brown color. This is one of our few examples of color change uh, along the coast of South Carolina. Uh, it's starting to die back, forming that rack we were just talking about. That rack will eventually break down into little, mic into 
microscopic bits of food called detritus. And that detritus, as well as the fungi and the bacteria that are doing the decomposition, they form uh, a nutrient-rich soup in the water and on the surface of the plough mud that many of the smaller animals out here depend upon for food.